Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's so exciting to see that there are attendees from all over the world, from Sao Paulo to Iowa to Boston, San Francisco, Barcelona. That's very exciting. And uh, my name is Ignacio Darnot, and I'm really grateful to Andrew Beer and George Benson from Oscar Wilde Tours for giving me the opportunity to give my art talk today. And to give you a sense of my background, I've been developing for nearly a decade now, a documentary series about the impact of gay artists throughout history called Hiding in Plain Sight, Breaking the Gay Code in Art. And my talk today uh, that is called Decoding the Closet in American Painting, Thomas Eakins, Charles Timoud, and Grant Wood is based on my research. So let's start with a little bit of history. It's not a surprise that the history of queer art is intimately linked to the shift in perception of homosexuality uh, through the ages. As I'm sure you know, and you can see in these images, same-sex relations enjoy a period of tolerance during ancient Greek and Roman times. It all changed with the advent of Christianity in the fourth century with emperors like Justinian, who blamed homosexuality for all the evils of the world, including famine, earthquakes, plagues. And needless to say, this had a seismic impact on art. So from that moment on, queer artists face a dilemma, hiding their sexuality or being out with their art and their lives. And in doing so, face prosecution from severe laws that were not repealed in many countries until recent times. This is why many artists who couldn't express themselves openly use concealing tactics to create homoerotic work in a way that was understood by those in the know without being punished for it. And I'm gonna be using the term homoerotic a lot. And the way I define this is an image that is not overtly sexual, but it's very appealing to the gay viewers in a subtle, or as you're about to see, not so subtle way. So today I'm gonna to focus on three crucial artists in the pantheon of American art. Thomas Eakins, Charles Demuth, and Ron Wood. And these are their self portraits, Eakins, Demuth, and Ron Wood. And the three of them use these concealing tactics I just mentioned to express their same-sex desire in their work. And I'm gonna start with Thomas Eakins. Eakins was an American realist painter who is now considered one of the most important artists of the 19th and the early 20th century. Um, today, he's famous for his extraordinary portraits, like this one, for his huge paintings, like the uh, Gross Clinic, this one, his sports images, and for his photographs. And while today his paintings sell, uh, sell for millions of dollars, however, he was a very controversial figure in his time when his work received very little of or no recognition. And I'm gonna show you how even sexuality impacted his work and his career. But before I get into Eakins, uh, I want to mention that we shouldn't apply our modern concept of homosexuality to Eakins. Eakins lived and created most of his crucial homoerotic work before sexologists came up with the term homosexuality, which in English didn't happen until 1891. So men of Eakins era didn't think that loving or having sex with other men was abnormal or put them into the sexual category of homosexuals. At, at his time, getting married and reproducing was a duty. It didn't prove exclusive sexual interest on the other sex. And here I have some images from the beautiful book called uh, Loving, that has images from uh, male couples in the 1850s, including this very touching image of this couple that says not married, but willing to be. And historians have identified three stages in the definition of same-sex affection between men. Up until the early 19th century, they were called friendships. Then in the mid 19th century, the trailblazing uh, queer poet Walt Whitman, you can see here, spoke in his work about camaraderie love and then manly friendships, 
fond, loving, pure, sweet, strong, and lifelong. And then after the Oscar Wilde trials, when the gay identity emerged in 1895, this is when it finally was called homosexual love. And then from then on, male news became taboo and suspect. So this shift around the perception of male nudity is at the core of how Ekin's staying in the swimming hole impacted his career. So today the swimming hole is considered one of America's most beloved paintings and is universally regarded as a visual poem to male youth in an idyllic setting. But underneath this bucolic image runs a huge sexual undercurrent, which turned it into the first contribution to male homoeroticism in American art. Eakins visited the Paris Salon in 1870 when he saw this groundbreaking painting by the French artist Frederic Basile called Summer Sea. And this painting was the most prominent large size image in centuries to showcase semi-nude males in a contemporary setting. The models appear fully nude in Basile's early sketches, but probably afraid of the repercussions, Basile decided to add clothes to all of them at the last minute. But be that as it may, this painting was revolutionary and it had a, a really huge impact on Eakins, the swimming hole. So Eakins painted the swimming hole as a commission. And to do that, he engaged several of his students to post nude outdoors, following the classical ideas of fitness and comradeship from the Greek gymnasium. But to squash any pushback to his very disruptive painting, Eakins loaded it with classical codes to cover his transgressive nudes with a patina of respectability. For instance, the pose of the young nude male on top mimics the iconic sculpture of David by Donatello from the 1400s. And the model the, the, uh, on the left is posing like the famous classical statue, the dying god. But in spite of all these classical camouflage, the patron who commissioned it was shocked when he received the painting and politely sent it back with a note asking Eakins to replace it with a painting that he could donate to an art museum someday. The fact is that Eakins had broken too many conventions. Instead of creating an Arcadian fantasy image of a faraway land, he displayed male nudity with no narrative justification, and he used identifiable young men in a recognizable local setting right outside of Philadelphia. And these were all no-nos at the time. But there was another more explosive reason for the rejection. The swimming hole is a very thinly veiled tribute to a poem about loving young males by Walt Whitman. Whitman, the poet, envisioned a future in which love between men would be invincible, not invisible. And in Song of Myself, a very important poem uh, included in his iconic book, Leaves of Grass, he described 28 young men bathed by the shore, 28 young men and all so friendly. Dancing and laughing along the beach came the 29th bather. So if you look carefully, you'll find how Eakins painted himself in the swimming hole as the 29th bather swimming towards a young man with his dog, who appears here. So after the commission was rejected, colleagues started referring to Eakins as, and his students as those Whitman fellows. You know what that meant. And this was the first of several scandals that ended with Eakins getting expelled from his teaching position at the Pennsylvania Academy when he removed the loincloth of a nude model in a class. So because of all this, the swimming hall remained unsold in Eakins' possession until his death, when his wife changed its title of the painting to the old swimming hall to associate the painting 
with a different non-controversial poem. So because of all this, Ikin sexuality is hotly debated to this day, with many scholars refusing to discuss his probable homosexuality. I believe, however, that his work and his life speak volumes. Ikin's hated the tight clothing of the prudish Victorian era. His obsession was capturing the human body in all its truth and glory. He wrote to his parents in a letter, a female body is the most beautiful thing in the world, except for a naked man. And Eakins took many photographs of male nudes, including his own, his handsome studio partner, Samuel Murray, an old man who appears to be the poet Walt Whitman, and his students. And he justified his questionable outdoor trips with his students by saying that he needed to take their photos to see the effect of sunlight on their naked bodies. And as I mentioned before, uh, Ikis is also famous for his sports images, many of which feature sexually charged homoerotic images. This one, Salutat, is one of his most famous ones, and it shows a boxer, but he doesn't show him in action. Instead, the boxer is the passive object of the gaze of an all male crowd with his buttocks as focal point. And in the painting, The Wrestlers, Eakins takes advantage of a trope that allowed queer artists to portray homoeroticism from the beginning of time. Basically, the trope is just show naked men wrestling and it will all be okay. So at age 40, Eakins married Susan McDowell, and here you have the only portrait he did of her during their childless uh, marriage. And in the portrait, Eakins' dog, the one you saw in the sitting hall, is portrayed with more warmth than his own wife, who declared very cryptically that Eakins had sadness for not being able to do what he wanted. And Eakins' dashy studio partner and constant companion was the sculptor Samuel Murray, who was 25 years younger than Eakins, and by all accounts, he was the most important relationship in Eakins' life, even after Eakins got married. And Eakins and uh, Murray went constantly on extended camping trips, and they took um, frontal nude photos of each other, like this one, and they forged a close friendship with Walt Whitman, whose subversive work was artistically rejected during his lifetime just like Eakins was. So in summary, Eakins produced work with homoerotic feelings and he probably had relationships with men. We can apply the label homosexual to him, but this is a modern day term. So it would probably be more appropriate to refer to him as queer. And his massive eight foot painting, The Gross Clinic, which is now considered one of the greatest American paintings in history, exempli um, exemplifies how Eakins' acceptance has changed through history. So this painting got a very polarized response when it debuted because of its realistic depiction of an operating theater. So unable to sell it, it remained in Eakins' possession until his death. So cut to the year 2006, when the Pennsylvania Academy the one that expelled him, had to raise nearly $70 million to make the Gross Clinic a part of their collection. And I'm sure that Eakins would have smiled at this act of poetic justice. So that's that for Eakins. So before we move on into Demuth, any questions, Andrew? Uh, no, there haven't been, but everybody remember uh, if you have um, questions that you can post them in the in the chat and we'll pass them on. I see that uh, someone has noted that the uh, Gross Clinic was purchased jointly with the yes. uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art. I thought that I'd seen it at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I saw okay. it at the Pennsylvania Academy. But they, they both uh, had to join forces to raise the funds. Yeah, I think I've seen it there. And note that the Pennsylvania Academy also has 
Eakins's portrait of Whitman. Yeah. Um, and someone has asked, uh, it rotates between the museums. Thank you. I wasn't sure about that. Um, and someone asks uh, if Eakins's photos are available in the public domain. Yes, they are. And there is a website, uh, I forgot exactly where, that has hundreds of them, which is a fascinating one. I think maybe the Smithsonian, uh, but I did the research and I found hundreds of them. Yes. Yeah, so we have one question. One question, which I'm not sure whether it's about Eakins or about other. Um, okay, we have two, two more questions. Okay. One is, someone says, it seems like there's less lesbianism in the paintings, uh, but I don't know if that means the paintings of Eakins or uh, art in general. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure quite what that, but maybe if you, um, the person is called PP, we don't have any names, but please <laughs> post, post, post uh, tell us what, what you're asking and we're happy to answer. Um, and someone is, at, people are asking who owned the Gross Clinic before it went to, uh, before the PAFA? It went, I, I remember reading about the Covenants. Oh, yeah. It came from some organization and then it was purchased from them, yeah. Yeah, I don't know who owned it. Yeah. Uh, ah, so it says, so we have, we have someone, someone knows all about this, Pennsylvania Hospital, which is okay. sort of vaguely I remembered it might be something yes. medical. That makes sense. Um, and uh, someone, uh, they, the question about lesbianism in art was uh, in general, it seems that there's less lesbianism in art in general. But that's, a, that's an important question that I, I have addressed that in previous talks here with the Oscar Wilde tour. In fact, uh, I had one of the talks that I did called the double lives of um, artists and I include several of them. And it is true. Um, a lot of the talks I do are about the classical period where there were very few because of their, how would I say, the low so position in the social totem, the women were by already relegated to a lower uh, place. So there were very few known artists and believe and imagine if there were fewer, imagine how many of them were openly less. So, so the, the, the pool to choose from um, is, is much more limited. But I have done a talk on that. And I, I, I was thinking, it's funny, I was thinking today that I should do a talk just on that because there are enough examples to talk about it for sure. Yeah, and um, if you come on, if I do again, the uh, so-called gay secrets of the Metropolitan Museum, we have three lesbian works in it. So there are a few here and there. Yeah. And, and of course, in modern times, there are lesbian artists. But... Um, like, like I spoke um, about uh, Georgia O'Keeffe in my previous talk, uh, <laughs> Frida Kahlo, both bisexuals, and Cecilia yeah. Ball from Philadelphia, who uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience today know about her, who is an extraordinary case of that too, on how she covered or how she expressed uh, in a covert way her um, lesbianism in her art. And also importantly, Tamara Lampichka. Uh-huh, Tamara Lampichka, all those. There's a, somebody one can really talk about. Anyway, please, uh, good. I think we can go on. That's it for now, okay. Okay, so now we're moving on to Charles de Mou. And I'm using the most common uh, pronunciation of his last name, uh, de Muth. He pronounced it de Muth, and his close friends called him Dean. And de Muth is a modernist painter from uh, Pennsylvania who is revered for his creation of art about America, like this one, with all the quality and innovations from Europe. And he, as you're gonna see in a moment, he was one of the key painters who laid the foundation for the huge prominence of American art in the 20th century. And he's also known for his extraordinary watercolors like this one, which are considered some of the most important in American history. And I'm gonna show you what went behind the scenes throughout his extraordinary career. So these three photos are a great starting point to talk about how DeMuth's frail health and his homosexuality impacted his work. So when he was four, uh, DeMuth had an illness in his hip that made him dependent on his mother for all activities throughout all his childhood. And this illness, uh, illness caused a limp that he had the rest of his life. So DeMuth used a cane for his limp, but this never sent him back. So the records show that when he was a youngster, he danced and did all the athletic activities as well or better than the other boys. And eventually he became a true dandy, really the definition of a dandy, affluent, educated, and gay. And his many friends 
described him as whimsical, with a high-pitched voice, and a tremendous joie de vivre, which I think is uh, encapsulated in this uh, photograph. And De Booth studied at the Pennsylvania Academy, where Eakins had been uh, expelled from. And in New York, he was a part of the avant-garde, which ironically, the avant-garde, in spite of its name, was far from progressive. And it rejected the connection between art and homosexuality. And a key member of the avant-garde was the great photographer Alfred Stieglitz, who had a gallery that nurtured many modernist painters, but he avoided the move. And this is really puzzling because at the time, Stieglitz uh, had an intimate relationship with Georgia O'Keeffe, whom he later married. And O'Keeffe was bisexual and a very close friend of the move. And here you have them in a photograph. Maybe because of this, uh, De Muth spent long periods in Paris where the study of the male nude was common and the art world, the community of expatriates and the Gertrude Stein Salon were much more tolerant of homosexuality. So when he returned to the United States, inspired by his European trips and artists that he revered like um, Oscar Wilde, De Muth started to explore his sexuality in his work. So in contrast with Eakins, De Muth lived and created art after the emergence of gay identity. So he lived at a time when being caught, being caught in a gay encounter would have brought him 20 years in prison, ruining not only his name, but his families as well. And analyzing the Muth's work, you find that he addressed three different audiences with three different kinds of work. We have the small figure paintings that include erotica and vaudeville images, like this one, his still lives, and large cubist images. And I'm going to show you how the Muth's homosexuality appears in different levels of these guys or explicitness in all of them. So in 1915, the mood started creating watercolors that explored the gay underworld in a way that no other American art had ever done before. There were two scandalous to exhibit in public. In fact, when I, when I saw them in Philadelphia 15 years ago, they were still shocking. And this is the reason why the moods only showed these watercolors to his friends marking the emergence of a gay subculture. And I'm going to start with uh, what is called the Eight O'Clock series that shows sexually ambiguous scenes. In the first one called Evening, we see a butler serving tea to two older men while a young man undresses next to them for no reason that we, are, at least we are aware of. In early morning, a man is wearing pink pajamas, while a young man in an undershirt looks like he's asking for money, while a naked man washes up in the background. In morning number two, we see a man in, the, in an undershirt getting dressed, maybe he's the prostitute from the previous images, while another man is naked in the tub. And the homosex homosexual theme in this series is coded. The mood could easily argue that these are images of friends in close quarters. So when he created them in 1917, the queer audience understood what was going on. But most Americans at the time would not concede that they were depictions of same-sex intimacy, to the point that early morning was purchased by Rockefeller. However, it's very revealing that they were not displayed in a museum until the DeMuth retrospective at the Whitney in 1987, when they were finally described as same-sex activity that just happened or was about to happen. The next series I'm gonna show you is called the Turkish Bath series, which is very provocative, explicit, and once again, private. In Turkish Bath from 1915, the focus of the painting is the buttocks of a lying man. And they are the focal point because the mood put a splash of red 
to attract our attention. And in Turkish bath with two figures, also from 1915, a man is looking at another man's crotch. This one from 1916 shows, called also Turkish bath, a phallic speaker here. And here, unfortunately, it's hard to see, but if, if you look at it um, uh, close up, there is a full blown erection uh, here on the upper left of the image. And the most important image of this series is called Turkish Bath with Self Portrait from 1918. And in this image, we see a group of men sizing each other's attributes, and one of them is even flaunting them openly. This is a self portrait of the mood, who is nude, his towel is on the floor, and he is prowling the Lafayette baths, which were key for the emergence of the gay subculture in New York. We see how the feet of these men are touching, something that would have been really unthinkable with heterosexual men. And on the upper right, you see two men in what clearly looks like an act of fellatio. And in the center, there's a man coming out of the water who is looking at the paddocks of a reclining man. So not surprisingly, the collector who bought this watercolor kept it hidden in the closet. And you're gonna see how in this series and in other series, Demuth never showed loving relationships. They were always anonymous pickups and voyeuristic encounters. And this is probably a reflection of Demuth's personal life that was marked by his poor health and social pressure against having a same-sex same -sex romantic relationship. Demuth also created a series of vaudeville watercolors featuring gay innuendo. For instance, look at this suggestive back handle in this image from 1919. And he did this image called Dancing Sailors. And we see how the central couple of sailors is embracing very intimately, while the other couples seem to be okay with that. The sailor on the left is checking out the one in the middle while their legs are touching. And this watercolor was exhibited at a museum at MoMA in 1929 under the excuse that it was common for sailors to dance with each other in the absence of women. But the reality is that there are women in the image and the central focus is clearly the male buttocks. This is probably why decades later, Andy Warhol was really inspired by how this work was shown at MoMA, a museum where Warhol was desperately uh, interested in showing his work. So the mood's life changed drastically when he was diagnosed with diabetes in 1920. And at that time, the only known treatment for diabetes was starvation which is what these two photos from Stieglitz reflect. So the Muth was forced to return to his family home in Pennsylvania, where his mother, Augusta, resumed her role as a caretaker until, he be, until the Muth became one of the first Americans to use insulin for his diabetes. But once again, he didn't let his illness affect his lifestyle, but it did impact his work. So the Muth, started uh, focusing on simple watercolors of the vegetables and flowers that his mother brought home from the market. So he grabbed her shopping basket every morning and took it to his studio to paint them before she could start cooking. But what is fascinating is that Demuth was obsessed with how much vegetables resembled the male genitalia. And he loved to capture that in many of his watercolors. For instance, in peaches and corn, or in eggplant and pears, where I would argue he anticipated the eggplant emoji by more than a century. There's two more here. Daisies with a very phallic base and tomatoes and apples and bananas. And 
The moods still lives sold like hotcakes, but they were accused by critics of being effeminate, disturbingly sinister, and they suggested decadence or maybe evil. So this is one of the reasons why Stiglitz, the photographer, distanced himself from the mood and he didn't show his work in his gallery. So the mood, who was now in his 40s, reacts to this criticism with a new series of industrial landscapes featuring phallic factory chimneys and water towers, many of which were in his hometown of Lancaster in Pennsylvania. And it's interesting that these are not big paintings by today's standards. The largest one measures two and a half feet by three feet, but all of them project a monumental and heroic scale and an unquestionably virile vision of America. In the early 30s, the Muth created his coming out paintings. And these are the first images that openly broke the wall between his private and his public life. So this one is Distinguished Air from 1930, which is loaded with gay codes. It was inspired by a story by the gay author, Robert McMahon, about an American gay, uh, American gay man who had a distinguished air, something that Demuth identified with. And in the image, we see a group admiring a phallic sculpture by Brancusi called Princess X from 1916, but not everyone is looking at it. Demuth painted his self-portrait with a cane, looking at the crotch or the buttocks of a sailor who is arm in arm with an elegant man, who is ignoring his female partner, who is covering her sexual part with a fan. And this painting reflected the shifting gender roles and the craze for uh, Freudian sexuality that was sweeping New York at the time. And two years later, he created this painting called On That Street, which took the composition that you remember from Turkish Bath with self-portrait to a more explicit territory. And it, because it shows two sailors hustling a client, a self-portrait of the mood in a street frequented by the gay community in Brooklyn. So when the Whitney Museum refused to exhibit a distinguished air, the booth reacted with an explosion of sexually graphic work, which once again, he only shared with friends, never in public. In this one from 1930, called Four Male Figures, we see a group of men, most of them nude, who appear to be cruising in a forest. And in this one called Two Sailors Urinating, one of them is holding the other one's penis in an image that is a metaphor for the liberating potential of uh, sexual desire. So you've seen how 50 years earlier, Jemuth created a composition of men seen mostly from the back, engaging in ambiguous erotic situations. But the watercolors from this new period turned the scene around to show full front, uh, frontal nudes in a world of rough trade. And there are many theories about why Jemuth created these images. Maybe it was to compensate for a possible impotence caused by his diabetes. Maybe it was a reaction to the repressive town of Lancaster, where he now lived uh, with his mother. Or maybe it was the fact that the Mood's partner, Robert Locker, started a relationship with another man. Or simply because at this stage of his career, the Mood was not so afraid about the threat of scandal. And this one called Three Sailors on the Beach is a landmark watercolor in the Mood's career because it's an open confession of his homosexual desires. And this very graphic scene shows a sailor undressing while his companions are engaged in sex. So personally, I can imagine that the Mood's health and social status would allow these kind of encounters. So most probably this would be a fantasy. But what is extraordinary is that Demuth inserted himself in the scene by tattooing his initials, CD, on the sailor's arm next to a traditional heart. And in doing so, 
he's defining himself as a homosexual. And it's very interesting that all the watercolors I've shown you survive thanks to the Muth mother, Augusta. So when the Muth died, she handed the watercolors to the Muth's partner saying, I'm sure that anything Charles did was art. You will know what to do with this. So many mothers at this time would have destroyed them, but not Augusta. And just to remind you once again, all these watercolors were not shown in a museum until 1987 at the Whitney retrospective, half a century after his death. And the final series I want to talk to you about from the move is what he called the poster portraits, in which he portrayed people and events that were important to him, but he didn't use a conventional likeness, but he used instead related objects and language. And I'm going to bring your attention to two of his most important ones. The first one is called Kala Leaves, and this is a coded portrait of a famous uh, male, I'm sorry, female impersonator, a Bert Savoy, the one who taught Mae West everything she knew. And the painting shows a coded tribute to Bert Savoy's life and death. So for starters, the Kala Leaves evoke the male and the female anatomy. But his death is also uh, mentioned in a coded way. The story goes that on a hot summer day in 1923, Savoy was struck dead by lightning while he was frolicking at the beach with four friends. So this shell and the blue wave underneath allude to the sight of his death while kala lilies are, are usually associated with funerals. So the hints at the homosexuality of the subject and the artist would only be detected by those within the mood's inner circle. And the final image in the mood is perhaps the best known of his career, and it's called I Saw the Figure Five in Gold. And he painted it in 1928 as a visual depiction of a poem by the queer poet William Carlos Williams. And it includes uh, the Moods initials and the artist, the, uh, the, 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 the poet, WCW, and the reference to Carlos, etc. And when this painting was first exhibited, it was a sensation. And it was described as a decidedly American work. So much so, that this the Muth painting really led to American modernism and it anticipated pop art and it influenced future queer artists like Robert Indiana, whom I'm sure most of you know from his love image. And Indiana created a series of paintings honoring uh, the Muth's image. This one in particular by Indiana was uh, displayed very prominently in the very homophobic White House of Richard Nixon, who was unaware of its queer lineage. And the Moots painting also inspired Jasper Jones, this one, becoming seminal for the pop uh, movement. And as I said at the very beginning of the lecture about him, laying the foundation for the prominence of American art in the 20th century. So this is it for the mood. So let me know if you have any questions. Uh, so far, there are no questions. Um, going, going on. You can always ask them at the end as at the well. End, yeah. We can ask them after Grandwood, and then we can um, consolidate all the Somebody questions. Somebody asks yeah. about, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> about the, the friendship between Charles Sheeler and Morton Schomburg, which I don't know about. So do you know anything about Sheeler's sexuality? I know nothing. No, I know. I mean, I love Sheeler. I don't know much yeah, about I mean, him. Yeah. Uh, but as far as I know, no. I love mm -hmm. Sheeler. I thought I, I, it's, it's actually one of my favorite artists, but I don't know much about that in that sense. No, all right. All right. If you have more questions, what, what, what? Who, here's a question, do we know who acted as Augusta's dealer? Art dealer. No, that I don't know. I mean, he gave it to, she gave the, all the, yeah. 
So That's what I, was I don't say. know what they're yeah. so they're part of, I'm sure this is like, because many of these are in private collections to this day. So I'm sure it went through kind of like a, a sub world of the of the gay culture, uh, giving it to each other, like Duncan Grant did the same thing. That's why mm -hmm. many of them are still, and also because many museums didn't want to have it as part of their collection. Like I say, they were not, uh, even when I saw the ones at the Pennsylvania Academy, they were kind of in a little room with a disclaimer at the entrance saying, you know, this is um, kind of sexual content, et cetera. And this is in 2000, probably eight. So that tells you how museums were kind of afraid to, to make them a part of their collection. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure how early the, um, early the morning and evening scenes came into the collection of the Wads of the Wadsworth yeah. Athenaeum. That might have been fairly early. They're adventurous though, as museums yeah. go. Uh, that's, uh, a, that's an easy one because that was still a little bit ambiguous. Exactly, because it's that's also implicit. The, and the and I think it might have, been a don might have also been a donation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's probably a donation. So um, yes, so here we have a number of questions, some of which oh. are very quick, which is that he died of diabetes. Yes, his mother outlived him. Yes. Um, somebody asks if there are, uh, is there coded sexuality in figure five? Um, yes, I, it, no, just, um, uh, it's about a poem uh, that talks about how the, the poet saw a, a tramway going next to him with a very prominent number five, and he was very impacted by that. So the image itself, it doesn't, but it's the fact that he's honoring a gay uh, poet, not the image itself. Yeah, I think there's also some Marsden Hartley painting. Yes, for sure. He's referring to, uh, and again, another gay artist yeah. in the background. Um, uh, and somebody asks if we know until 1987 who had the paintings. I don't, I don't know, and I don't think we know. No, I mean, different, like I say, a lot of them were in private. A lot of private. them. A lot of them were, to this yeah. day, to this day, like the, the sailors is in private collection, and the, a lot of them are. Right. The, 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 uh, yeah, so. Passed through the gay community, as it were. Yes, exactly. Exactly. All right. I think, I think we're done with questions, so go on. Uh, you can go on. So let's move on to Grand Wood. So I've been researching Grand Wood, the painter of the iconic American Gothic, uh, for a decade now. And when you read about him, it's very easy to buy into the irresistible image he created of the homespun artist of rural America. But just like in his painting American Gothic, there's much more than meets the eye. And in my research, I've seen how books and exhibitions have stuck to the official version of his life, keeping him in the closet. So this fable, was finally put to bed by a recent retrospective at the Whitney Museum, which declared that Wood's homosexuality is the code that unlocks the truth to his art. And I'm going to show you his images. I'm gonna tell you now his incredible life story. Grant Wood's childhood marked the rest of his life. He grew up in a farm in Iowa, but unlike his brothers who took to their father, he rarely worked on their farm. And Wood was born in 1891, coincidentally, the year the term homosexuality was first used in English. And as I'm going to show you, his sexuality had a tremendous impact in his life and in his work. And he created a very strong, some would say, unhealthy bond to his mother, Hattie, and his sister, Nan, whom he painted in these two portraits. And as I will explain later, his sister, Nan, who posed for American Gothic, denied her brother's homosexuality until her deathbed. Grunwood was determined to become an artist. And he knew that studying in Europe was essential for that. So he went to Paris throughout the 20s, where he studied Impressionism, and he created paintings, many paintings in this style, like this one. And Grunwood was chubby, shy, and because he didn't speak French, he couldn't use his biggest weapon, his wit that he was famous for. And in Paris, he experienced gay culture for the very first time in the company of a fellow artist called Marcel Bordet, whom he nearly brought home to mother. 
But it was during these days, the, his first days of freedom, that he painted a large male nude called The Spotted Man, which is one of the only two of his paintings that he kept in his possession until his death. So back in Iowa, Grandwood told a friend, well, I guess I'm not interested in women. And he got a small lot where he worked and lived next to his mother and sister, who slept next to him on pull-out beds. And this is a photo of his studio today. And to give you a sense of the importance of this period in his life and career, when Grandwood moved in uh, in 1924, he was just a local artist from Iowa. When he left 10 years later, he was a star of the art world. And Grandwood's homosexuality was an open secret in their town in Cedar Rapids in Iowa, which tolerated a small and uh, gay and lesbian subculture as long as it remained invisible. And the owner of uh, Grandwood's favorite bar said that Grandwood was gay only when he was drunk. And the truth is that coming out would have threatened his reputation, his freedom, and his income. Maybe that's why he uh, would carve in a school bench the motto, the way of the transgressor is hard. And in the middle of this alienating environment in Iowa, Wood realizes that his impressionistic work made him appear less than manly. So he pretended that he never took it seriously, calling it wrist work. And he embraced a new art movement that would be called regionalism, which was truly American, not copied from Europe or descended from New York, a movement that glorified rural America. And this is when Wood shaved his bohemian goatee, that, uh, the one he grew up in France, and he fabricated a new persona, adopting denim overalls as his uniform, implying that his work was man's work and branded himself the farmer artist of America, who was, of course, heterosexual. So in 1927, Arnold Pyle, one of Wood's former students, became his assistant. Pyle was 18 and Wood was 36. Here you see them in a photo, Graham Wood and Arnold Pyle. And Pyle was good looking, tall, athletic, with thick black hair and heterosexual. Exactly the type of man that would continue to fall for over and over throughout his life. And Wood disguised his desire for all these young men under the facade of paternal affection towards an admiring pupil. And Wood and Pyle spent their days in their small studio within small uh, Wood's home, watched over by Wood's sister, Nan, and their mother, Hattie. And it is in this very charged environment, personally, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall <laughs> to see what was going on, that Wood created Arnold comes of age, which was his loving gift for Arnold's 21st uh, birthday. And it's very revealing that this is one of the only three portraits that Wood created out of love throughout his career. The other two were the ones I showed you earlier of his mother and his sister. So this painting reveals Wood's desire uh, for Arnold Pyle in a coded way. So the painting has a melancholic mood that expresses Wood's sadness at being unable to consummate their relationship. There is a theme of couples in the painting. Two trees, two haystacks, two bushes, but all of them are separated by something. probably alluding to his, oh, sorry, to his yearning for Pyle. And Pyle's dark sweater cast a very gloomy shadow on two new young men, skinny dipping in the corner, that evoked the traditional images of Adam and Eve expelled from paradise. But in Wood's painting, they have become Adam 
an atom, with one of them thrusting his buttocks backwards, probably, and they are far away from the prime eyes and the laws that would have sent uh, Wood to prison had his feelings for Pyle become uh, known. And to the left, a butterfly lands on Pyle's sleeve. And the traditional interpretation of the, of the butterfly is that is a metaphor for the transformation of Pyle from a young man into a mature man. But this visual has many other layers. The butterfly tea shop was their favorite hangout in town. And just like a butterfly disguises its beauty from, uh, from the uh, predators, that's what Wood had to do as a gay man. And the belt, which was probably also crafted by a grand wood, has Arnold's initials, A, P. And it's hard to see, but Grand Wood signed his name next to it. Probably because at least in this way, they could be united forever. So 1930 was by far the most important year in Grand Wood's career. Because in addition to Arnold comes of age, he painted American Gothic, which turned him into an instant celebrity. So if you think about it, there are only a few paintings, probably two, that are recognizable around the world, Leonardo's Mona Lisa and American Gothic. And they both share the enigmatic expression of their subjects who are begging you to look at them closer and ask for questions, which is exactly the opposite of what Grand Wood really intended. So the story goes that on a teaching trip to Eldon, Iowa, Wood became entranced with a <clears throat> small house with windows shaped like the ones he had seen in European cathedrals in the style called Car Carpenter Gothic, um, hence the title of the painting. So Wood decided to create a painting with two figures standing in front of the house, a farmer wielding a pitchfork and a stern woman both featuring elongated faces matching the window. And Wood's sister, Nan, who was 30 at the time, modeled for the woman wearing their mother's outdated clothes. And Wood's dentist, who was 62, posed separately as a farmer. In fact, the two models didn't meet each other in person until they posed for a photograph in front of the painting 12 years later. So the painting was an instant sensation. It's subversive and ambiguous. Quality prompted a barrage of questions. Are they father and, uh, and daughter, husband and wife? And if so, why is he so much older than her? So while some critics described it as a bedrock of American values, other ones accused it of mocking rural life. And Wood loved this controversy because it stirred publicity and interest. And I found a review from a Boston critic that said, Wood must have been tortured by these people who couldn't understand the joy of art within him and tried to crush his soul. And I believe that this critic was onto something. Considering that Arnold Comes of Age was created at the same time that American Gothic, it's not far-fetched to interpret that what American Gothic truly depicts is Wood being watched like a hawk by his sister wearing their mother's clothes with Wood's dentist as his alter ego. In any case, this sudden celebrity was a curse for a man with a secret like Wood. So major publications described him as a shy bachelor who maintained, maintained a discreet silence about marriage while mentioning his high-pitched voice all very obvious allusions to his homosexuality. So early in his career, just like many other queer artists did before him, Wood created classical, mythological, and patriotic images as a cover-up to express his homoerotic desires. For instance, in the mural Adoration of the Home, he included homoerotic images of builders and the Greek god Mercury. And the central panel of his triptych, The First Degrees of Freemasonry, is this image of Harmodius and Aristogeton 
two ancient lovers who became a classical symbol of Greek democracy after they assassinated a tyrant. And in this uh, part of a stained glass that Grant Wood created for the Veterans Memorial Building in Cedar Rapids, we see a soldier, Shutters, who was modeled by Arnold Pyle. And next to him, there is a soldier who looks very suspiciously like Grant Wood. And as his career advanced, unable to express his sexuality openly, Wood sublimated his repressed desires in homoerotic paintings of rural scenes, which contain multiple meanings, in a way daring us, the viewers, to decipher them. And many of these images reveal his desire towards the farmers that he grew up with in Iowa. For instance, in Saturday Night Bath, he shows two young farmers, one deep in a pocket, into a very phallic trough, while another one is stripping his shirt off nearby. And speaking of hunky farmers, here's one of the many he created, shirtless, with tight pants, and his buttocks as focal point. In this image called Breaking the Prairie Sod, the farmer is holding a very phallic uh, plow handle, while his female companion is covering her sexual parts with a, uh, with a hat. I guess she doesn't seem to want anything to do with it. And in Farmer with Pigs and Corn, Grandwood makes the young man's sexual potency very clear with the placement of the corn. So in 1935, the health of Runwood's mother deteriorates. Wood panics at the prospect of not being able to justify his bachelorhood any longer with the excuse of taking care of her. So what did he do? He married overnight Sarah Sherman Maxson, a former opera singer, several years older than him, and already a grandmother. Runwood and Sarah had met at the dinner party a few weeks earlier, and none of their friends or family were invited to the ceremony. And Sarah was a larger than life personality. I picture her as Meryl Streep in the film Florence Foster Jenkins. She didn't care about her husband's sexuality. In fact, she described the sex in her previous marriage as repellent. And Brad Wood said that they understood each other. And they moved to Iowa City, where uh, Grant Wood got a teaching position at the university. But what is interesting is that Sarah's deadbeat 28-year-old son, Sherman, his wife and daughter, moved in with them. And following his usual pattern, Grant Wood was immediately smitten with him, nearly adopting him. And Sherman modeled for one of Wood's illustrations for the book Main Street by Upton Sinclair. But what is very interesting is that Sherman appears not at the intellectual, described in the book, but as an icon of rugged masculinity holding a phallic baton. But as if this wasn't enough, Wood hired the handsome 23-year-old Park Renard to co-author his autobiography and to model for another one of his book covers, this one. And Renard's constant presence at home made Sarah hugely unhappy. And Renard wasn't gay but he recognized Grant Wood's attraction to him. What is interesting is that the regionalist art movement that I mentioned before had provided Wood with a masculine farmer cover, but Wood remained closeted because the leader of the regionalist movement, Thomas Hart Benton, was wildly homophobic. And in 1936, Grant Wood created his only major painting during his marriage, this one called Spring Turning. So look at it for a second. So at first glance, you know, it depicts a bucolic farming landscape with rippling hills. But if you take a closer look, you'll discover the massive contours and sensual back and buttocks of a male farmer wearing overalls. He even painted the back pockets of the overalls. 
So this extraordinary painting was attacked in the press as queer. They never explain why, but that's probably the reason. But in spite of that, Wood couldn't stop himself. He produced soon after a lithograph called Fertility, which featured a penis-like silo and ears of corn that were jutting upward, defying gravity like a massive group of erections. And then he did this uh, lithograph called Sultry Night, in which we see a farmer pouring water over his naked body next to, again, a phallic trough. And there's a voyeuristic element to this image due to the fact that the man has his eyes closed, which allows the viewer to fully examine him with no concerns. So when the United States Postal Service refused to distribute uh, this image on the charge of obscenity, Wood denied that there was anything sexual about it. And he invoked the nudity of the classical image of the god Apollo. He insisted that this was a depiction of how, after a long day in the fields, we used to go down to the horse stand with a pail and drench ourselves. I find interesting that he mentioned we when he barely worked at a farm. But so when the post office stuck to his guns, would cut off and burn the nude from the painting that inspired the lithograph, and he never produced a male nude again. So Wood painted the very somber Death at Ridge Road in 1935, the year his mother died and the year he married Sarah. And the painting shows the looming clash between rural life and modernity, with the telephone poles acting as funereal crosses. And at this time, the marriage, uh, like the marriage between Ramwood and Sarah ended in very bitter terms after less than four years. Sarah left for New York City, but surprisingly, her son Sherman and his family continued to live with Grand Wood. And on top of that, Park Renard moved in immediately with all of them, and this caused a disastrous chain of events. Five university colleagues in Iowa City filed a complaint against Wood for being a homosexual with a strange relationship with his assistant. They even convinced Time Magazine to send a journalist to investigate Wood's sexual life. But the article never appeared because uh, the word of Wood's failing health due to pancreatic cancer leaked out. And Grant Wood, who uh, now was in his latest uh, days, delirious from morphine, told his sister Nan that he wanted to move to Palm Springs, where she should be on the lookout for an oriental houseboy. And Wood died hours before his 51st birthday with Park Renard as his only companion. And Wood's last word was his sister's name, Nan. And this brings me back to Grand Wood's evil sister, Nan, and an epilogue to this fascinating cast of characters. So Arnold Pyle died in a car accident in 1973 while he was traveling back to Cedar Rapids after attending the first Grand Wood Festival in Wood's birth town. And Park Renard never finished Wood's autobiography, probably because the facts would have conflicted with the myth that Grand Wood had created. And it's interesting that Renard got into politics and he became a tireless advocate for gay rights in the 60s, when this was a very problematic uh, topic. And I can only guess that he did this as a tribute to Grand Wood. And after their divorce, Sarah Sherman was, uh, worked as a housekeeper until she moved to New York City to break back into show business and successfully. And Nan survived her brother for nearly five decades, milking the fact that she had posed for American Gothic. And she spent the rest of her life spreading myths about her brother's female lovers and suing anyone who tried to mention his homosexuality. She even burned Grant Wood's letters because she said that they were unimportant. And it is her militant presence 
the reason why Wood's homosexuality was never discussed publicly, and it was really avoided by all exhibitions until the Whitney retrospective three years ago, which finally addressed it. And this is the image, the photo that uh, where she and Byron uh, met for the very first time 12 years after they posed separately for American Gothic. So in summary, Runwood had a significant impact on, on American art and he influenced uh, future movements such as pop art. And 90 years after its creation, American Gothic is one of the most widely reproduced and parody works of art in the world. And this is something that I'm sure Brand Wood would have really enjoyed. So that's it. Uh, thank you so much for your attention and let me know if you have uh, questions. So uh, great talk, Ignacio. We have yes, several questions you. here already in the notes. Um, oops. Uh, so somebody asks in the portrait of Nan that you showed as uh, right at the yes. beginning, what is in Nan's hand? It's, it's a little chicken. And um, there's been a lot of people trying to give a, some kind of meaning to, to that. Uh, but, you know, and a, and a piece of fruit. So, you know, your guess is as good as mine. But there's some people that go a little bit too far in trying to decode all the elements in Van Wood's work. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, these are questions people are talking about. Um, uh, sorry, there are lots of comments. Um, lots of people saying they like the talk. I'm trying to, I think there was another question buried in there, but I've lost it. Um, ah. Oh, uh, in the 1932 photo of him, there's a painting. Is there a significance to the painting? Uh, hold on. That is one of his uh, most famous paintings, but no, he just happened to be posing next to it. It's a, a, a painting called Spring, something Spring too. It's just a film. No, there's not a special. It's, it was the one that he was painting at the time. Um. All right, more questions, any more questions? Uh, we wanna just say thank you on behalf of the Zooming Through Queer Culture series for coming. Hope you guys will come again.